filming their documentary, the young Kubrick began his work in a, in, as a photographer. That's correct. Yes. So, when we see his films um, as a special sequ sequence of eye selected and constructed images, it is like he, he, he has always been a photographer. Uh, like each photogram of his films are uh, perfect photographs. Uh, so do you think this particu particular choice of moments and situations was es essential to his construction of filmography? Um, in his case, yes. I mean, he was a cinematographer, and, and that part played a big role uh, for his films. But, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. There are very, very good films made by people who are not particularly fussy about cinematography. So in the end, the quality of a film depends on, on many different elements to, to form a li liaison with the audience. Now, take another extreme. Take a film a documentary by Michael Moore, you know, which is, uh, photography is not a particularly, uh, not an item. And they're uh, fantastic for other reasons, for content, for uh, relevance for today. Now, it's, it's a different style. Take Ingmar Bergman, which is beautifully photographed by Sven Nyquist, wonderful cinematographer. And he did the work so that uh, Ingmar Bergman liked it. In case of Kubrick, it was exactly the same. He had, of course, camera, a camera crew, but he did the setups and he did the lighting. The lighting is everything because that determines the f-stop. And, and Kubrick loved to work with open lenses and a minimum depth of field. What a particular style, and um, uh, it can also be uh, quite uh, difficult sometimes. <laughs> you know, an extreme case would be Barry Lyndon, where the f-stop on the candlelight shots was 0 0.7, and you have no depth of field at all. Yeah, I mean, it's that much, <laughs> yeah, if you are close. So, um, yes, he paid tremendous attention to, to the composition of um, his films. And it is referred that uh, the time that Kubrick spent uh, in shooting uh, to achieve an ideal scene, the time he was uh, using, um, like he was uh, looking for the essence uh, to show in the sequence of the films. Uh, we we have been reading uh, about uh, about his photography, and there there's a comp uh, uh, an author that speaks about uh, the words of Cartier Bresson. Uh, that is, in order to give a meaning to the world, one has to feel involved in what one frame in a, in a viewfinder. This attitude requires concentration, discipline of mind, sensitivity, and a sense of geometry. It is by economy of means that one arrives at simplicity of expression. I, I want to bring this down to a practical level. It means lighting tests. So every night uh, on Eyes Wide Chat, for example, the setup for the next day, the crew was dismissed. It was just two, three people were left. And we did a lighting test for next day's shooting. That was developed overnight so that in the morning you saw the result of the lighting test and you could tweak a little bit here and there. So that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm trying to um, compress what you just read into one practical statement, and that is testing, so that you are sure that particularly if you work with practical light, whereby you see the light source in the shot, and you work with open lenses, you can really delicately move your... Uh, yeah, what what you call this is the, the faders, so that it looks realistic, that it looks real, and it is still the practical light. It's very very hard sometimes to judge that with your eye. Uh, you can use a Polaroid, but the best thing to do is just shoot a few meet a few meters of film and see the result next morning. Um, That's bringing all the philosophy and the theory down to what you actually yeah. have to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in his films, um, this, there is a process of reality perception construction. Uh, when um, he was looking for the exact detail uh, that gives the information about a, a certain environment. Mm -hmm. So I, I can explain that with the, uh, I'm giving you two situations uh, in your uh, documentary, the observation of Jack Nicholson 
um, when Kubrick said to him, you don't train to photograph the reality, you train to photograph the photograph of reality. Yeah. And there's also the research of uh, your son, Manuel Larlan. Uh, there, there is in the, we saw this in the Kubrick box. He was uh, doing this research for uh, Eyes Wide Shut uh, in collecting Im images of, about uh, different locations mm -hmm. uh, for the movie. So this is really um, like constructing the, the reality. You look for the, the spaces and the locations. Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> you, could, you could compress this as well uh, by saying that you, you want reality, it has to be real. But more important is, it has to be also interesting. And, and that's where, where, where it gets complicated. You can have realistic uh, locations, but if they are not interesting, if they don't serve your story, if they don't uh, make the audience um, sit up and, and be fascinated by it, then it doesn't matter that it is real. So, um, yeah, Sidney Pollack uh, put it very, very nicely when he quoted Stanley, and he said, well, Stanley always felt that uh, real is 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 uh, yeah is important and it is good, but interesting is better. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Um... But this is true for everything you do when you shoot a film. The cinematographer is one element. It's the sound. It's the acting. It is everything. Uh, you know, the reality has to be felt by the audience. It is not to be realistic. Realistic is totally uninteresting. Uh, real is something else. A perfect example would be Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's totally unrealistic and it is completely real. It's right. also the same uh, construction of your reality in uh, Barry Lyndon, but mm -hmm. he, like he's joining some uh, different factor factors, like uh, the natural lighting or the, the candle light that he mm -hmm. uses, and the, the Mitchell BNC camera and the, the Zeiss lens. Um, you, you think this this choice um, of using just the, the natural lighting in Barry Linden was the main way to represent that reality? Uh, to to we all know the paintings from that period, and that's all we know. We have never seen interiors and how people look like un unless we look at paintings. That's all we have. And he wanted to create the atmosphere that we know from the paintings of the time. It's as simple as that. It's interesting, if you look at these old paintings and drawings, people had their tables always near a window. Why? Yeah, because they wanted daylight. Yeah. So they worked in the day. Uh, and uh, that's what he did. And also, uh, you know, candle lights were, and, and oil lamps were the only source uh, after dark. And uh, if you look at a Rembrandt painting, how beautifully this is done. The, you know, one candle lights the whole picture. That's what he wanted. <laughs> Can we say that this, this special use of light and shadow brings a magic atmosphere um, to, to, to that con constructed reality? Well, I think so. I mean, it, it's not for me to say, you as the audience, you have to say, if you look at Barry Lyndon, and, and uh, yeah, today that's easy. Today you have fast lenses at 1.2 is a standard lens and, and you have much faster film. We were limited to 100 ASA and you couldn't push it. It became so grainy, it was awful. So now all you did is have this incredibly fast lens and live with the fact that you have no depth of field. But you saw the result. How does it look to you? It's not quite as good as Rembrandt, but it's as good as you can get with cinematography. In Full Metal Jacket, uh, it, it is said uh, uh, there is a specific time for shooting uh, in your documentary. There is a specific time when uh, people are tired. Uh, the so-called magic hour. The magic hour is 15 minutes. Very often not longer than that. It is just when you get sort of well, you have a, a, an exposure at f4 still, you know, and, and uh, because you need a depth of field, it has to be reasonable. But you don't want, you, you don't want bright light. You, you, it's, and it's a very limited time because once the sun goes, it, it drops very drastically. And so you prepare all day long for these, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, and then you do the shooting. It looks more interesting. I mean, you know, is it, does it happen? Of course you could shoot earlier. And it would still look okay. 
okay is one thing, brilliant is something else. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> since you are cinematographers, you all know what it means to shoot early morning and late at night. It's just different. You want long shadows also and all these things. Yeah. So, uh, did you have a, a preferred time for uh, each shooting? Absolutely. Preferred time was uh, just before sunset. Uh, as yourself a music lover, uh, I would like to ask you about the, the importance of music and classical music mm -hmm. that you talked uh, yesterday mm -hmm. uh, in the story and in the, as a scripting tool, uh, in your words. So, like in Kubrick's films, uh, Gergely Ligeti's music seems to direct the images. Um, and and uh, also sometimes there is the combination between the, the mental images that the music gives us and the, mm -hmm. the result in the, 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 this... Uh, in the filmography. What do you think about this importance of the music? Well, it's colossally important, as you know. Uh, in some cases, there are brilliant films without music. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, as I say, it's one pillar in the structure of, of a film. And sometimes that pillar is essential, and sometimes it is not. Uh, if you have practical music to, to move a story, forward it's just wonderful otherwise it could be just like I, I call it Wi-Fi between the audience and, and and the screen you don't necessarily have to listen to the music it just lifts the scene and it binds the elements so this has to be looked at from top yeah in each case you have to analyze it um, the use of music is very very different from scene to scene it has a different purpose but it, it can be very important and if you get it wrong it's a disaster for the film. And as I always say, the most important part is that the filmmaker himself or herself really loves the music. Yeah, you told that yesterday. <laughs> yes. I mean, if, if that isn't given, you're, you're on the wrong track because then you can't judge anything. You, know, you cannot judge four other people. That's very dangerous. Yeah, that, that you can't do that. Uh, that may be true in, 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 in commercials. I really don't know anything about it. But the main thing is that you love what you are doing, because otherwise, why should anybody? The, during the, the, the filmmaking, uh, Kubrick, Kubrick, he worked together with the, the musicians, the Getty, for example. Not necessarily. No. It, it depends what it is. Take Eyes Wide Shut. That's the most recent film I, I was very much involved in. The Shostakovich Waltz was decided months before he started shooting. Um, he always, he always wanted this. He wanted a waltz, in this case, in a minor key. Um, and he got it, and it was melancholic. And he, he liked the Shostakovich arrangement of this old waltz, which is a French Musette waltz. And um, yeah, so, and he used it. He loved it. He wanted to use it. He liked it so much. Yeah, that element comes through. And uh, well, then we have totally different mu music, like the Ligeti. You know, Da, 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 da. Now, that's not particularly beautiful music. but And, and for a long time he had something else in, in mind. And then he decided what else he had was not too beautiful. He didn't want it to be so beautiful. He wanted this, this aggressiveness of this music. And uh, in fact, we specially recorded it uh, a little bit slower as a, a, a CD that was on the market with this one note, D, 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 really being over recorded and biting and rather ugly. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what he wanted. He was very clear about what he wanted. Did you ever uh, uh, work with, with your music because you're a cello player? So. Um... Well, I have, I have a cello, let's put it like that. <laughs> now, yeah, our, our music was a big part in my life all the time, and I suggested a lot of music for films, but I never decided, you know, as I said yesterday, a film is made by one person in the end. Other, a film, no committee has ever made a great movie. <laughs> you know, so that's okay, I like my role very much. I, I, I was a member of the crew. Okay, thank you very much. You're most welcome. <laughs> thank you.